All righty. Well, hey, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Monterey Bay Aquarium here live all across the internet. I hope everybody can hear us okay. And if you can hear us, please give a thumbs up in the chat. Let us know that we are all here live right now. We're currently looking at a very young baby flamboyant cuttlefish here behind the scenes at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. For those of you that are just tuning in, welcome to everybody who's here live with us right now and welcome to everybody who is watching us currently on the replay. If you're wondering who is talking to you, my name's Pat. I work for the Monterey Bay Aquarium social media team and I'm over here right below me on your screen. You should be able to see there that little baby flamboyant cuttlefish. And uh, we've got Emily that is currently there on the camera making sure everything is looking good. And um, I'm joined today, uh, Emily and I are joined today by one of our esteemed colleagues, a cephalopod aquarist extraordinaire. And if I do my picture in picture, there is Elizabeth right there. And let me just transition her back here full screen. Elizabeth, good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here uh, with all of us. Can you tell us a little bit about your job here at the aquarium and uh, where are we right now? We're in the pretty cool behind the scenes spot here. Yeah, we are behind the scenes of the tentacles exhibit um, and uh, we are looking at all of our holding animals. Um, this is where we keep the babies as they're growing up before we can put them onto exhibit um, and we like to have their eggs growing up over time and yeah that that's where we are tentacles that's awesome yeah <laughs> so uh behind the scenes uh so we've got over here on uh on this video we've got these little baby flamboyant cuttlefish uh here on the screen right now uh can you just tell us a little bit about what it's like to be somebody that is raising the next generation of these animals for our tentacles exhibit. We have visitors in the exhibit hall right now taking a closer look at these at these animals. What's it like to be working behind the scenes making sure that there's something for the folks to take a look at? It is very time consuming because you have <laughs> to be watching the populations as they grow up and our exhibit cuttlefish, they lay eggs on exhibit underneath shells and rocks and then once that happens, I usually collect their eggs about once a week. That's how often they're laying. I bring their eggs behind the scenes. I clean them up a little bit, and then we use their eggs to um, develop the new generation. And by doing that, we will put them into what we call a bubbler tank. I think we'll show you that a little bit later. Um, once they're developed enough from the bubbler, we'll put them into a little basket, and they hatch out of the basket into a hatchling tank. And then we progress them up as they grow in the size of food that we're feeding out over time. Excellent. So um, we've got a question here. Uh, what is the purpose of having uh, a growing area here at, at the aquarium instead of uh, going out into the wild and collecting uh, these animals for, for display? What's the, what's the idea behind, uh, behind your work here raising these cephalopods? Right. So the best part about keeping them behind the scenes and growing them up behind the scenes is that their life cycles are fairly short. So it's easier if we can monitor them over that period of time. And then we have another group that's ready to move on to exhibit once they're ready to start laying eggs. And the best part about it is that we don't have to take animals out of, out of the wild every nine months when the next generation needs to be in our exhibits. Um, these animals are really, really sensitive and taking them out of the wild and moving them into a captivity or putting them, you know, they, these ones specifically, the flamboyants come from Australia. And so their flight from Australia to here is fairly stressful. And we try and limit that kind of stress from them. And by doing the raising behind the scenes, we can eliminate that sort of transportation stress. stress. Gotcha. Yeah, I know there's probably a few folks uh, that are that are out there that have a little bit of transportation uh, stress themselves whenever they're they're out there moving around there, Elizabeth. So uh, Emily is currently moving the camera around, making sure that we've got the the flamboyant cuttlefish there in front of you. Uh, one of the questions there, Elizabeth, that folks were were having is, um, do we have to worry about inbreeding when we're taking care of uh, these cephalopods here uh, behind the scenes? What kind of genetic analyses uh, do you need to do with them? 
Yeah, we do have to worry about inbreeding. Uh, it's usually only an issue after the fifth to seventh generation. And mostly what happens is that the animals fail to produce eggs that are viable. And so we don't see any um, any effects to the animals themselves. They still <laughs> eat and behave normally. And Sorry, Elizabeth, I just want to interrupt because just now on camera, we literally had a shrimp kind of smack the flamboyant <laughs> cuttlefish in the face, excuse me, and push its way over. So it would appear that you've done a really good job of feeding uh, the flamboyant cuttlefish this morning because uh, a shrimp literally got away with murder, as it were, just then slapping the, the flamboyant cuttlefish. Can you tell us a little bit about the interactions there, food and uh, predator in there, just real quick, and then we'll go back to what you were saying. Excuse me. Yeah, our flamboyants get fed about three to four times a day. And um, like Patrick was saying, they were fed really well this morning. So normally as soon as a flamboyant sees a shrimp he'll gobble it up but uh looks like they are full from their first two morning feeds there you go so that uh, in case anybody was out there wondering how it was exactly that you just had a shrimp smack a flamboyant cuttlefish there it means that the flamboyant is still uh digesting uh it, its meal right there but um yeah, Elizabeth, sorry, back to what you were saying as far as uh, managing the stock, making sure that everyone is, uh, is, is breeding well, is healthy. Um, back to what you were saying. Yeah, so we don't see any um, detrimental effects on the generations as we breed them um, up to fifth to seventh generation. It kind of depends on the um, cohort, although they do stop producing viable eggs. And when that happens, usually we'll reach out to other institutions and we will swap eggs so that we're increasing our genetic diversity, but also limiting our impact on wild populations. There you go. Now this question, you know, we usually get this question whenever we're working with the animals. Um, you might be in a pretty unique position because you have so many animals in your care, so many generations. Uh, these flamboyant cuttlefish, let's just make sure everybody out there knows that it's up to them to name them. You have not named every single one right. of the cuttlefish that we have here. Is yes, that correct? I yeah. do not name <laughs> all of the cuttlefish. I care for all of them, but I do not name them. Yeah. So for all of you folks that are out there at home, we've got Emily with two flamboyant cuttlefish there. You're free to put as many name suggestions as you would like in the chat up to y'all to, to choose. What was that, Emily? One of them is named Emily. That's that's very <laughs> clear. Be. Yes. Um, but uh, but yeah, you're uh, we like to say that they are uh, what's known as cute Thulus, cute Thulu. That's one of my uh, my proudest puns there. So for those of you out there looking into the baby cephalopods, uh, cute Thulus like these ones right here. Now, um, one thing I wanted to, to show uh, real quick here, Elizabeth, is uh, we've got these young flamboyant cuttlefish here on exhibit, but we also have some really, really great video footage here of a, a baby two-spot octopus and a baby uh, reef octopus that I wanted to show off real quick. So uh, while I play those videos of those octopuses, can you uh, just describe what it's like, maybe the difference between taking care of a young octopus and a flamboyant cuttlefish? That's something folks are asking here, what kind of differences there may be. And right now we've got the octopuses uh, up on screen. Here we go. So I'm sure most people know that octopuses are escape artists. Um, they will do anything in their power to find any weakness in a tank that you put them into. So. The biggest challenge with baby octopuses is that you have a tank that is small enough so that you can see them, but also secure enough that they will not get out and they won't harm themselves. Um, additionally, if you have more than one baby octopus, uh, you don't want them um, going into each other's enclosures because they can damage each other. You know, the baby octopuses just don't get along with each other. They're solitary animals, so we try and make sure that each baby octopus has its own tank and it's very secure in that tank. Um, but its care overall is very similar to the flamboyant cuttlefish in that they have to be fed many times a day, at least four times a day when they're even smaller. Um, they have a pelagic phase when they're floating in the water column before they settle down into their more adult form. And at that phase, you have to keep um, them fed 24 seven. And so that can be challenging as well. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, so just now we had uh, we had the video there of the young two-spot octopus, and then right now we have uh, a young um, 
I believe, was it a day octopus or a reef? It's a Caribbean reef octopus. Caribbean reef octopus is the young one there. What can you tell us about uh, this animal uh, as, it, as it walks around in one of our, uh, one of our display there, uh, displays for filming there? I would say that the Caribbean reef octopus are more of a shy species that we keep. Um, those ones can be challenging because they are more inclined to find a cave and hide or burrow. Um, so to keep those animals happy, you have to give them places where they feel secure, but they can also still be seen by the public. And so uh, that's how Caribbean reef octopus are more challenging. Um, Caribbean reef are warm water species versus the two spot octopus is a cold water species. So we have both of those enclosures available behind the scenes and the ability for us to change our exhibit from warm water to cold water based on which octopus we have and which one's the appropriate size to be in that tank. Excellent. And so we do see right now just that absolutely adorable little uh, reef octopus that's walking around. Can you give the folks at home maybe a sense of scale of how big those little octopuses are that, that we're mm. filming? I would say they are a little bit smaller than a dime. All right. Okay. Smaller than a dime. There you go. So probably smaller than what uh, some of the folks out there uh, were thinking. Now, um, the last little bit of uh, stock video footage that we had filmed by our uh, wonderful video team uh, previously is just some young flamboyant cuttlefish uh, video. So I'm going to put that up on screen right now. Um, what can you tell us about um, just what it's like to take care of those cuttlefish? Something you haven't mentioned previously already as I put up the the video footage, which is just superlative. Just look at look at this little hovercraft there. That's just so dazzling, so beautiful. What's it like working with these with these tiny ones? The small ones are really fun. The ones in that video specifically were about 10 days old when that video was taken. And um, the one of the best parts of my job is that I get to see these animals grow from stage to their next life stage. And as they're growing up, they take on larger and larger food. So like we saw earlier with that flamboyant and the shrimp in the tank, they can take on uh, food sizes that are about similar to their size. However, when they're very small, like those 10 day old ones you're looking at now, they take um, mycids or juvenile mycids because the juveniles are about half the size of the full size mycids and the flamboyants need to be fed many, many times as they're growing, um, but they can't consume something that's as large as they are. They also, I mentioned previously, they're uh, easy to stress. Um, mm. And one of the ways that they stress is if there's too much food or if the food <laughs> is too large, they <laughs> will shy away from that. And we don't want them to stress in any way. So we monitor them very carefully as we are feeding them and make sure that they're getting not only the correct number, of food items but also the correct size that's awesome so just just thinking about uh <laughs> just thinking about then how many of the folks out there watching might also be stressed out if the food that shows up is rather large and intimidating <laughs> in front of them and also the consequences that that might have for your own well-being and taking care of yourself if you so choose to try to eat all of that so same <laughs> types of considerations there right. uh, with the cephalopods that's wonderful um, well, we've had so many questions here uh, for you so far. Um, one of the questions we have here, I don't know if you mentioned it already, but uh, how many different species of cephalopod are we taking care of here behind the scenes at the aquarium or have we had uh, on, on display previously? How many different species? Yeah, I, I don't know a number off the top of my head, but I know currently we are displaying flamboyant cuttlefish, the pajama cuttlefish, the uh, stumpy cuttlefish, mm -hmm. and we have a common octopus, a two-spot octopus, a red octopus, and the big fin reef squid as well. Gotcha. Yeah. So um, aside just from these young uh, flamboyant cuttlefish here, so many different um, species that you're seeing here currently on the screen there. Um, but yeah, if you come to the tentacles exhibit, so many different species of cephalopod here um, that we are home growing here at the aquarium. Uh, let me just check the chats here, see what kind of questions uh, folks may, may have. Oh, uh, this is a question that we, we always want to get to. Uh, but for you, um, Elizabeth, what is your absolute favorite part about working with 
um, with cephalopods? I know you've talked on uh, what's great. What, what is something maybe surprising about working with these animals that you learn in working with them? Oh, Emily, it appears that we have lost, we have lost a camera. The cannon decided to give up here midway. But you're, you're live there, Elizabeth. Tell, tell us okay. a favorite aspect. Uh, something surprising. One thing that I really, really love is when um, I'll be growing the uh, hatchling cuttlefish. And once they get to a certain point, I know that they're ready to take down a shrimp. And at that point, I will offer shrimp. And you'll see this little tiny cuttlefish come over, swim up to a shrimp that's a little bit smaller than it is and take it down and it's just like the most adorably ferocious thing you've ever seen. <laughs> so that really, I love coming in on days when they're ready for shrimp. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, we, we love a shrimp week ourselves too on the, on the social team uh, for the aquarium. Uh, currently, for those of you who may have just been tuning in, we got flamboyant cuttlefish stock video there uh, in front of all of you. And then over here, we've got the live flamboyant cuttlefish behind the scenes here at the aquarium. Uh, let's see, let's go to the chat real quick, see what kind of questions the folks may have. Thank you everybody for tuning in from all around the world right now watching. Uh, if you are just joining us, welcome. We're live behind the scenes at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. We are here behind the scenes of the Tentacles special exhibition here live for hashtag Cephalopod Week, which is a project of our friends over at Sci Fry, and if you want to find out more about what's going on in the Cephalopod Week world, whoa, uh, let me see, what did I just do there? Uh, if you want to learn more about what's going on in the Cephalopod Week world, make sure that you take a look at hashtag Cephalopod Week. There we go. Take a look at hashtag Cephalopod Week on Instagram, on Twitter, all across the internet, wherever you can find that hashtag so that you know what is available out there in terms of cephalopod content. And you can take a look at our website, MonteryBayAquarium.org, and you will find uh, all there is to know about what we have planned for our very own cephalopod week there. So, okay, with that word from our sponsors, let's just uh, come over here. Oh, this is a wonderful observation that we have um, from uh, some of the, the folks watching over on YouTube, and I believe it was a question over on Twitch as well. Can you tell us a little bit about this display that is going on on the flamboyant cuttlefish, the waves of color passing down uh, their back? What are we looking at there? Yeah, so the cuttlefish on their skin have the um, opsin protein, which is similar to what we have in our eyeballs. And that protein allows them to almost see with their skin and um, their skin is replicating what would normally be seen in the wild, like when waves are passing over them or clouds are passing over. Um, and they just show this, um, that this is kind of like their default coloration. Um, but also I think the flamboyant that you're looking at right now with its um, top two arms in the air those are its arms, not its um, tentacles, which we can talk about that later if you want to know. But those arms are sort of like their defense slash feeding posture. So they'll bring their two top arms up, showing that they're interested in food or that they are defending an area. And then right after that, usually they will eat. Okay. And we currently have a bit of a face off between a glass shrimp and a flamboyant cuttlefish <laughs> over there uh, in, the, in the corner. Um, some of the folks out there, uh, can you describe to us a little bit about this living uh, LCD screen or LED screen maybe is the better uh, term, uh, different LED screens there on the back of this cuttlefish. How is the cuttlefish controlling uh, what's going on there? Oh yeah, so each of the cells that contains that opsin protein um, uh, they're called chromatophores, and so they can constrict um, those cells and they will change which color is being displayed based on how dilated that cell is. Okay, and we've got another question. Somebody who knows a little something about cephalopod skin, do they also have iridophores and leucophores in their skin for these animals? I do not know the answer to that okay. question. Thank you for asking that. I will look that up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's um, it's a it's an excellent question for the folks out there who might be wondering what those uh, words just were there in the chat. Um, different cephalopods have different ways of controlling the light on them. In particular, the big fin reef squid that we have behind the scenes uh, 
at the aquarium. And actually, I might be able to pull up a photo of one here in just a second. But um, the Big Fin Reef Squid that we have uh, behind the scenes, they have a rid of fours where that's how you get the greens and yellows and blues around their eyes, so aridifying the light. And leucophores are little mirror-like cells that bounce off white light or whatever the incident light um, is there. Um, but a lot of what's going on there, as Elizabeth was saying, on the back of these um, flamboyant cuttlefish, that's a lot of chromatophores that are opening and closing and going across there in that wave. So um, this leads to a question there, Elizabeth, that I'm sure a lot of folks are having. What kind of uh, personalities and emotions do these animals show you when they're, when they're at the aquarium? Can you tell how the, the animals are doing just by uh, looking at them and what kind of uh, information they're offering you? Yes, definitely. Their um, posture, like I was talking about, their arms, uh, that will signify if they're hungry or if they are being defensive, if they're um, scared. And their coloration, definitely, because they have so, such good control over what colors are being displayed on their skin. I can tell if something is bothering them, if they have too large of a shrimp in their tank or if there are too many males in a tank they won't get along um, so a big part of my job is sitting and watching them and seeing how they're responding to their environment and each other gotcha thank you i am so very close elizabeth to getting uh, a photo here of the big fin reef squid uh, up on screen. Um, can you tell us uh, just something else here real quick before I, before I put the big fin uh, reef squid up on screen? Any other uh, cuttlefish fact here just for the next like 15 seconds? I'll, I'm almost there. <laughs> so um, cuttlefish have eight arms and two feeding tentacles. So lots of people while they're watching the cuttlefish when I feed them at the aquarium in their exhibit, they'll say, oh, their tongue's coming out. And it's actually two feeding tentacles that come out. They have suckers on the end. Um, they protrude them out between their arms and that's what grabs the food and pulls it into their beak. Um, once the piece of food is into their beak, then they can use their arms to kind of finesse which direction that food is coming into their beak and um, that's how they consume their food. That's awesome. Thank you for that. And then here now, before all of you, there's a photo of some big fin reef squid there taken by our staff photographer Tyson. You can see on the back there some of the white stripes there. Those are going to be those um, leucophores that are bouncing off the white light. Then you can kind of see around um, the rest of the body some of that uh, orangey brown color. Those are going to be from the chromatophores. And then around the eyes you see some yellows and greens there. That's the aridifying uh, behavior there. So different ways that cephalopods can control not only their camouflage, but also the expression of their own uh, emotions there on uh, on themselves and communicating with other cuttlefishes or, or octopuses or squid, whoever you happen to be there. Okay. So with that, let me just transition back to myself real quick because I'm going to look through the questions and Emily is adjusting the camera there. So let's just see what kind of questions we've got. Oh, this is a really, really awesome question uh, here, Elizabeth, that we always get and something that I always find fascinating. It looks like the flamboyant cuttlefish is walking and it looks like they're walking on all fours sometimes, but obviously they don't have hips. They don't have, you know, uh, arms like us, like shoulders and everything. So how does this whole walking on all fours stuff work with, uh, with, with these animals. It's really, it's really something to see when they're walking around. Yeah, they, they are unique in that they uh, spend most of their time on the bottom, unlike other cuttlefish. And the way that they do that is they have papillae in their skin. Um, it's basically like protrusions that they can control. And you'll see it not only how they're like, quote unquote, walking along the seafloor on their ventral side, their belly side, but also on their dorsal side of their mantle, they can have those papillae protrude up to display different meanings amongst their group. And so they have control over uh, the papillae ventrally and dorsally. Awesome. And uh, just to everybody that is currently uh, raiding us over there on Twitch, thank you so much for the raid, everybody. We've got uh, Wine and Winds uh, raiding us right now. So some folks are, uh, if you could just tell us in the chat what kind of, uh, what kind of wine pairs well with baby cephalopods. Now we'll know, you know, for, for later. Um, 
But, uh, yeah, Elizabeth, did you, you, you mentioned this already, but maybe we'll uh, answer it one more time. A few folks wondering where in the world do you find flamboyant cuttlefish again and where did these ones come from originally? Let's just uh, recap that for the folks. Yeah, they, we call them Indo-Pacific, so they're mostly around Australia and a little bit around New Guinea. Awesome. Now, I've actually been a very fortunate, uh, I've been able to see um, a, uh, I've been able to see flamboyant cuttlefish in the wild myself That's diving awesome. uh, in Indonesia. And yeah. one of the things that I didn't realize is that they're mostly brown most of the time hiding on the muck. So they're not actually as flamboyant as standing out uh, um, like that all the time. They're very well camouflaged, typically walking around. So a question that I'm sure some folks are having out there. Um, why are these uh, cuttlefish so expressive, especially when they're young like this? It seems like they're already ready to go with, uh, with their self-expression the, the, the minute they're, they're out there. So what, why so expressive there for the, for the flamboyants? Yeah, we do um, a pretty good job of displaying them on substrates that are different than what they would normally be on. In the exhibit, we try and mimic that natural color. So it's more like the mud or muck you would see them on in the wild. But behind the scenes, it makes it so much easier to do my job if I can see them really well. And so the best way to do that is to create high contrast with this lighter color sand and um, really fine uh, coarseness of the sand. And um, especially when they're small, they are also, they're not only communicating to me, uh, you know, how they feel and if they're hungry and things like that, but they're also communicating amongst each other um, and getting ready to get to that point in their lives where they're sexually mature. And so they're trying to figure out, you know, what's the hierarchy of my group here? Who is someone that I want to be mating with? And, um, how many males are in this group? How many females are in this group? So lots of things like that is what they're communicating by showing this beautiful display. Okay, that's awesome. And a, a follow-up question to, to all of that, is there sexual dimorphism in these animals and uh, do males and females behave differently, generally speaking, is the question. There is not obvious sexual dimorphism. The biggest thing is that um, once they reach sexual maturity, the females grow at a faster rate and will be overall larger. However, their coloration is pretty much the same. Uh, their behavior is very much the same other than um, when they are mating, those things are very different uh, because the males will come over and then the female gets to decide if she wants to take sperm from the male. And oftentimes there is um, conflict between different males who would like to mate with the female and so that can be a very interesting process is, you know, <laughs> who, who gets the female and how was that decided? A tale as old as time across many animal species. <laughs> I, I imagine, yes, yeah, some folks out there recognizing it. Uh, a question here. We've mentioned it maybe uh, a few times already. Um, but how long do these animals live in the wild and here at the aquarium? Is there a difference? There is not really a difference. The, they live about nine months. Um, you know, give or take a month or two. And they are sexually mature after about four or five months. So uh, as you can imagine, they're reproducing quite rapidly. And we're, we almost always have hatchlings coming up. Gotcha. Um, let's see, there was a question here. Oh, we might get to this uh, a little bit more, but um the question is, is for you specifically, Elizabeth, how does one uh, get into this kind of work? What kind of educational background did you have? I know you mentioned a little bit introducing yourself, but uh, what, was your, what was your meandering way over into the cephalopod world? I studied marine science at CSU Monterey Bay, and then I started as an intern my senior year in college. I interned here with um, a cephalopod aquarist at the time, and um, about nine months after that, there was an opening and I was hired. So for anyone who's interested, I would say if you can be an intern, if you can volunteer, or if you're just interested in taking care of cephalopods in general, you can also do field work or lab work, and, but definitely having a degree in biology or some sort of marine science will help you on that route. Excellent. And uh, folks are pointing out that uh, 
Um, flamboyant cuttlefish is a good name for them, but maybe Rorschach's cuttlefish also works out very well with the, the interpretive dance going on there with the chromatophores on the back. So yes, thank you for that suggestion there. Uh, in the chat, uh, let me see. There was a good question I was trying to figure out. Oh, yeah, yeah. So this, this would be a way for us to play um, a few more of the uh, Young Two Spot and Reef Octopus video. But uh, Elizabeth, how real is it uh, that the octopuses actually do escape just in general? There's a lot of tall tales of uh, octopuses out there in the world doing uh, so many different things uh, in their escape routes. So um, how concerned are you truly about the escape? It, it's a very, very real thing at the aquarium. Yes, I think we are concerned. However, I worked here for six years and not once has an octopus escaped. So Knock on all the cephalopod wood you can find. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we try our best to create enclosures, you know, for thinking, how will this octopus test this enclosure? How will it respond to the things in it? Um, is it being fed enough? Because that's one thing that they'll go looking for food and that's what kind of draws them out of their enclosure is like if they're looking for getting food elsewhere. Um, also, if they don't feel that they are covered enough, you know, lots of octopuses like to burrow or have a den. Um, so we try and provide enough cover that they feel comfortable so that they don't go looking for those opportunities to escape. Awesome. Oh, these are uh, a few great questions here um in a row uh so are any of these animals are you concerned about them uh biting you or anything because of a venom that they might have is there are there considerations there um there i'm less so concerned about their venom as i would be about just their the damage that their beaks would do in general okay um like i said earlier the flamboyants are really they stress easily and so they're much more afraid of like when my hand is in the water than I am of them. So they will move out of my way. Um, I would be more concerned with animals that have larger beaks such as like the giant Pacific octopus because its beak can be very large. It could crush a finger. However, when I'm managing that species, I don't allow my hands to get close enough that that would ever be a concern for me. And I also want to keep the octopus safe because they shouldn't be ingesting right. humans. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's a two, it's a two for there, uh, keeping everybody safe away from each other's mouths so that, yeah, we don't <laughs> cross contaminate. Um, we've got a lot of folks that are shouting out the CSUMB otters in the chat. So go, go otters. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, oh, so a question here is, uh, flamboyant cuttlefish, are they venomous or poisonous uh, themselves? It was claimed that they were, but I don't think that that claim has been substantiated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for some of the folks out there who uh, may be new to some of our streams, oh, hold on, let me, uh, let me remove this video real quick of the reef octopus show myself talking there. Uh, yeah, we've had a lot of work done here at the aquarium on flamboyant cuttlefish. One of the things we found out, maybe not uh, toxic in the way that they had been described previously, and that's thanks to uh, the work of Elizabeth and a lot of the other aquarists here doing a lot of science with them. Turns out it might just be all for show. It might be one of those examples in nature of an animal just being so ridiculous that a predator is just like, you know what, I'm just not even gonna bother. I'm just gonna go find something that's a more standard, uh, more standard fare there. Wonderful. Well, thank you everybody again for uh, tuning in right now. We are live behind the scenes at the Monterey Bay Aquarium with some of our young cephalopods. Right now we're looking at some young flamboyant cuttlefish, Metasepia pfefferi for the folks out there who are looking to look that up. Uh, let's see, we had a few questions here. Oh, um, you know, this is this is a question that uh, folks have been have been wondering. I think we can uh, address it here. Some of the folks out there may know that we used to have nautiluses on exhibit here uh, at the aquarium, and that we were doing some breeding on them. It's a very very difficult thing to to try to work out. Um, Elizabeth, can you tell us a little bit about uh, nautiluses generally? How challenging is it to have them uh, on display in public aquaria these days? Because things have definitely changed over over the years for nautiluses. Yeah, nautilus are very hard to display. Um, they're very sensitive and their eyes are very sensitive. So having them um, in front of the public requires us to light them so that you can see them. 
And then if anybody accidentally uses a flash, that can be very damaging to their eyes. Um, additionally, we haven't, no one's ever like closed the loop on a Nautilus reproduction cycle. And so we're able to collect their eggs, but we're never able to get them from egg to adult. And so that can be really challenging for us because we like to uh, grow up those next generations in order to display them. Gotcha. Gotcha. Awesome. Yeah. So for the Nautilus fans out there, um, don't don't you worry. They're still out there in the ocean, just maybe not at the aquarium at the moment. Uh, again, because of how difficult it can be to, to provide the proper environment for these animals, which, again, is what Elizabeth and her team are, are always looking to do. Make sure that they're very comfortable here at the aquarium. Um, let's see. Oh, this is a good question that some of the folks uh, are wondering. If you were to change your outfit, uh, would the animals respond to a change of color or what, like what can they see in color is, is one of the questions because they are so colorful. But then also, um, if you were to change your appearance, would they be like, wait, where, where'd mom go? It, <laughs> like how, how would, how would that happen? Um, they don't see color. Um, but they do respond mostly to movement and um, I'm not sure that they're seeing me as like an individual so much as they see movement at the top of uh, the water and then they'll see food come down and so they associate you know vibration near their tank like if I'm walking towards the tank I will vibrate the ground and then they feel that and then mm. they see the food coming down into their tank and so that's sort of the association that they get from me um they wouldn't be able to necessarily distinguish me from another person gotcha okay thank you for that um the question is why have a behind the scenes area with the babies why not just put all of them in front of the exhibit uh, in front of everybody what one of the things i think you know that that i certainly learned when i first started working um at the aquarium is that you know there's almost twice there's a double aquarium when you visit the aquarium. There's in front of the scenes, and then there's behind the scenes. What uh, for the folks out there who might be wondering why why have a behind the scenes with all this kind of culture happening? We have behind the scenes space because um, animals that can be sensitive need to have that area that we take care of them where it's like very low stress, very low light. Um, and we're able to control the environment a lot more. So. It, we, it also gives us an opportunity to get animals used to seeing people all the time and having that movement around them um, because most of our exhibits, especially in the tentacles area, have like 360 degrees of glass so they can be seen at any point. Um, those animals will really need to get used to seeing people every day and often. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, same as why you probably wouldn't take a behind-the-scenes tour to uh, a maternity ward to go take a look at everybody. You know, there's a lot going on when, uh, when these animals are young and before they go there on exhibit. Um, oh, this is a question, uh, a great question here. Um, some folks out there might be wondering, do we ever release the animals that we have in our care here in Tentacles back out to the wild? That might be something we would do with an ocean sunfish or a seven-gill shark, but uh, cephalopods, what's going on there? In tentacles, we do not release them because most of our animals are not from this area. So they would not be suited for Monterey Bay. They're mostly warm water species and wouldn't be able to survive in our very cold water in Monterey. There you go. Yeah, so great question over there. Um, hold on, what is this question here? They're talking about our friends at It's Okay to Be Smart. Oh, um, can, what are some other senses that these uh, animals have? Could they tell you apart from, uh, from touch if uh, these animals were, were to touch you? Could they tell you apart that way? Right, yes, they definitely can. Um, their suckers have like tasting cells. The, uh, they are chemosensory. And so they can definitely taste slash smell um, a difference between my hand and another person's hand. Okay. 
Good question. All right. Now, I, uh, this question has been asked a few times here. Uh, and this is another aspect of your job that folks maybe don't think too much about. Um, should these animals become sick or injured? What kind of, uh, what kind of band-aids or uh, other procedures exist for, for uh, a cephalopod that might have a, have an, uh, a little boo-boo? Uh, some folks out there are wondering. Specifically, they're asking, I, I should just be clear, Specifically, they're asking, has anyone ever performed cephalopod surgery? Uh, um, and I don't, I don't know the answer to that. But what kind of health care exists for, the, for these animals? We, well, let me answer the surgery question first. <laughs> we wouldn't perform surgery on a cephalopod because their skin, once it's like cut open in any way, it wouldn't be able to be, be rehealed. You know, uh, you wouldn't have stitches like in mm. human skin. Mm. Um, but that is another reason why we have our behind the scenes space is so that we can have an animal that is maybe sick or injured and that animal can have its own enclosure and it can have that peaceful relaxation time to heal. There we go. All right. Something, yeah, learn something new every day uh, when it comes to these animals. One of the things that um, I learned when people were taking care of abalone is that abalone uh, are hemophiliacs, so if you cut them, there's no blood clotting and they, they'll bleed out. So um, yeah. similar, yeah, lots of different considerations there. Um, or consider oceans, as some of the folks in chat are saying that there's a distinct <laughs> lack of puns here. Because sometimes we do the straight science, everybody. Sometimes it's not just all pun and games. We're out here trying to learn a little bit more. Um, but no, thank you everybody for all of your uh, great questions here. Oh, someone's mentioning that they look a lot like a sea slug, look a lot like a nudibranch uh, right now. Very, very pretty there. Um, they're beautiful mollusks, uh, but not new to Branks, no? Let's see. Oh, yes, question here. Can we see any of the egg sacs in that exhibit underneath the abalone shell? Are those are there eggs on, on display that folks might be able to see? Um, yeah. Yes, there are some. Um, I think we will get you oh, yeah. to let's see turn, our, let's turn that camera. Uh, our bubbler tank over here. Emily so, on the camera moves, everybody. Check this out, get ready. So these longer eggs over here are our big fin reef squid eggs. Um, they are almost like finger shaped as they come down and each one contains many, many baby squids. Look at that. So these are uh, eggs homegrown at the aquarium, correct? Some folks are, are wondering that. Yes. Oh, Emily just zoomed in. And you, no, you, it's, it, don't apologize. We've got things in focus now. Um, so uh, yeah, born, uh, hashed out here at the aquarium, how might you encourage them to lay eggs? For the big fin reef squid, they really love laying their eggs on grassy beds. And so we will introduce some fake grass into their enclosures. And then once they're sexually mature, they will just on their own start laying eggs onto that grass. And uh, once that happens, usually we'll remove the eggs so that we can clean them and as you can see they're like moving around a little bit from the flow in this tank yeah. they benefit from high high flow they need a lot of oxygen at this stage well at all stages and um, they will hatch out from this position once they're dangling and have enough flow they'll hatch out and then we'll put those hatchlings into a new tank so that we can feed them people are saying that they look like somebody blew into their glove and tied off the fingers yes <laughs> <Yeah>. definitely <laughs> we've made some artificial eggs that way before okay <laughs> awesome uh hey emily i'll transition back over to the flamboyant cuttlefish uh maybe let's show them the the bubbler over there because you were mentioning there that oxygen flow there elizabeth uh, that is something that um, the flamboyant cuttlefish uh, themselves are providing, right? So we have uh, we have the technology of uh, of moving uh, our water around, but how how does this bubbling action happen uh, in in the wild with these animals? Yeah, in the wild for the flamboyants, the females are really good caretakers, so they will stay with the eggs once they've been laid and periodically go in and start blowing. Uh, water over them to aerate the eggs and keep anything any sort of fouling organisms off of the eggs and just keep them until they start hatching so to mimic this we put them in this bottle and we use a lot of water flow and allow them to tumble gently without um, allowing things to settle in on them and the water is very clean in this system and then that's how we maximize how many babies we get out of each batch of eggs because in the wild you would have some eggs that would foul um, that wouldn't turn out but we would like 
to have the most hatch out and be successful. Wonderful. And a great job, Emily, on the bubbler. A lot of folks saying that this is a very uh, mesmerizing display and maybe we'll have to come bother you and film uh, cuttlefish egg bubbling for some kind of a long form video. Add some add some ambient music or, or <laughs> something to that. Um, yeah, I think one of the ben biggest benefits of the flamboyant cuttlefish eggs is that they're translucent. So you can actually see them developing through the sides of their eggs mm -hmm. at certain points. And that's not always true for cuttlefish. Like for our stumpy cuttlefish, they have a little bit of their ink incorporated into the egg casing, which makes them a darker brown, opaque color. And so it's much harder to see them as they're developing in their eggs. Awesome, awesome. All right, well, uh, I will transition me back here on the screen. Uh, oh, because actually <laughs> the cannon decided to go to sleep. So uh, we're making, we're, we're given, we're, we're the, the tech is giving Emily a run, but she is crushing it. There it goes, right back on, no problems there. Uh, everybody in the chat, if we just get some, some W's or some uh, GG's in the chat, Emily moving all the cameras around here in this space. And obviously thank you to uh, Elizabeth for spending so much time here with us. Can't believe it, it's already 2.51 here, so we just have a few minutes left here behind the scenes at the aquarium with our flamboyant cuttlefish uh, and the rest of the young cephalopods that we have here at the aquarium. Um, so to make sure that we get to this uh, so we don't forget, Elizabeth, just want to ask you very quickly, for the folks out there who are watching this stream and they're thinking, this is it, this is what I want to do, I want to work with these animals, I want to take care of them, what kind of advice would you give to them? folks interested in pursuing this kind of career, interested in pursuing this kind of work, and then where can folks, uh, where can folks get started? Where can they, where can they start um, having, having some of these experiences themselves? If you wanna start immediately, I would say volunteering at your local aquarium. Um, but if you're in it for the long haul, definitely getting some scientific education, higher education under your belt will help you on your route to being an aquarist. And usually the route that that happens by is you gain your degree in some sort of marine science, biology, uh, both are applicable, or you volunteer for many years and just get the experience with working with the animals under your belt. Excellent. Thank you so much uh, for that. So yeah, for the folks out there who are wondering how to get involved, you heard it uh, there first. Um, one of the questions that folks have been having here do you have, if you could raise, and money is no, uh, money is no object, and uh, you've got all the space in the world, what is your dream first cephalopod to work with? And then if any animal in existence, past, present, future, uh, I will maybe stick from this timeline backward, uh, what animal would you love to work with? So like number one, if you could have any cephalopod on display, which one would it be? And then if you could have any animal, past, present, uh, which one would that be? I think the coolest cephalopod, which definitely deserves to be on display at some point, would be a Humboldt squid. I don't Ooh. know if that would ever be possible because you would need an entirely enormous enclosure for them. Um, but that would definitely be top of my list to work with, a Humboldt squid. And um, I don't know, past or present, uh, which animal I would want to work with. Maybe a blue whale would be pretty cool. Okay. All right. So I, I hear you're describing a situation here where we have, uh, where we just have a, a massive, massive enclosure <laughs> that's one blue whale and then only Humboldt squid around it. Yeah, and so definitely. It, okay, yeah. So if anybody <laughs> out there is looking to fund any type of aquaria, you know, uh, if you've got a little bit of residual income lying around, a couple billion, uh, might be interested in having the blue whale uh, Humboldt squid and it uh, looks like you'd be Aquarius number one there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, wonderful. Okay, well, folks, keep sending us those questions uh, that you might have. Emily has got us here on the flamboyant cuttlefish, uh, but we're going to wrap up this stream here in just a little bit. But again, we're behind the scenes at the aquarium looking at some of the magic behind the scenes, making sure that we have animals on display for the visitors. We currently have our exhibit hall open. You can head over to MonteryBayAquarium.org to make your reservation uh, so you can come and visit us and come and see these animals on display for yourself. Again, it's hashtag Cephalopod Week going on right now. 
And if you want to check out more of what we've got going on, again, MontereyBayAquarium.org. Search Cephalopod Week, and you'll find that. We also have uh, the links all around. Uh, Emily is is uh, looking at me like she's got a suggestion for something I should be talking about. What do you think? What was that? Oh yes, and of course, sorry. Let me just yeah. So okay, so I'm being uh, yes. It's a good it's a good note. We have at the aquarium an egg lab in front of the scene, so you actually get to see at times bubblers, little baby cuttlefish, little baby um, pajama squid, other uh, other animals that we might be. Uh, growing up, we do have that egg lab component right by the camouflage game uh, in the exhibit hall. Um, it's always it, it's good to have a backup brain over on the other side, making sure that I uh, provide the adequate information there for all of you. So that's something there for you. Um, but uh, with with this last little bit, I've got two questions uh, that the folks have been having here, uh, Elizabeth. The first question. Uh, here is why no one-sided glass in an aquarium setting? How come not just the one-sided glass? We don't use one-sided glass because it would um, distort the image a little bit um, and it doesn't allow us to light the animals properly. Also, some animals will respond to themselves. Like if you put a mirror in front of different sorts of animals, they will get aggressive because they think it's a another animal who looks like them and is the same size and things like that. So we eliminate that by just using acrylic panes um, that we can see through on both sides. There you go. Yeah. And then one more question for you, Elizabeth, and then I'll wrap up with my final thought for you. Uh, the question here is, are there any endangered species of cephalopods that we have here at the aquarium? Are any of them endangered? I don't believe the ones that we currently house are endangered. The Nautilus are, but we don't have them currently. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So for the folks out there wondering, none of the ones currently on display, they might be uh, rare to see in an aquarium setting, uh, but not uh, rare to uh, where they're found out there in the wild. Um, but um, the Nautiluses, as Elizabeth mentioned, uh, many of them are, there's different subspecies, subgroups of them that are listed, and there's lots of work being done. Uh, we worked closely with some folks out in Fiji on our Nautiluses uh, and being able to have them on display. So um, yeah, lots to, to think about in the Nautilus world. Okay, the final thing for you, uh, Elizabeth, as we are wrapping up uh, this stream, do you have any parting words, any cephalopod facts, burning things that folks really need to know, or uh, anything related to like an anecdote that kills over Thanksgiving in your family related to your work that folks just didn't know? Do you have any final musings about uh, being a cephalopod mom behind the scenes? Hmm. I know I left it very open-ended. I'm not, open -ended, <laughs> I'm so. not sure. <laughs> I, I can't think of any stories or musings, I guess. One interesting thing is that the flamboyant cuttlefish, while they are really sensitive, are less likely to ink. Like when you scare an octopus or a big fin reef squid, they are very fast to ink and use that as camouflage to get away. But the flamboyants rely so much more on their coloration um, and people, or I guess animals, assuming that they are venomous. And so they're less likely to ink and that can be a benefit for me um, because they will tell me with their skin much earlier than like a big fin reef squid would with its ink. Wonderful. So if everybody here in the chat could just give a big thank you to everybody involved. We got Elizabeth, we got Emily. Um, and uh, you don't have to give me any thanks uh, behind the scenes here because I can just write all those thanks into the chat for myself if I needed them. Uh, but if we could just thank everybody here. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your expertise. Everybody's being very grateful uh, in the chat here. Um, for those of you who are just tuning in right now, we're wrapping up this live stream, but we will have it available as a, a VOD video on demand on our YouTube, on our Twitch, on Facebook. It'll also be there uh, on Twitter when it is all wrapped up and said and done. So if you're just tuning in, uh, do not worry. Once we're done here, once the platforms process the video, you'll be able to watch this. But this has been behind the scenes here with our flamboyant cuttlefish and young cephalopods here behind the scenes of the aquarium for hashtag cephalopod week. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank, Thank you, you so everybody. And we will see you again soon at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, everybody. Thank you so much and happy 
Cephalopod Week. Thank you.